Section 16 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Jetta of the Lowlands. Conclusion. By Ray Cummings. Chapter 15. In the Bandit Camp. The dark cave, with its small spots of tube light mounted upon movable tripods, was eerie with grotesque swaying shadows. The Bandit Camp. Hidden down here in the depths of the mid Atlantic lowlands. An inaccessible retreat, this cave in what once was the ocean floor. Only a few years ago, water had been here water black and cold and soundless. Tremendous pressure with 3,000 or more fathoms of the ocean above it. Fishes had roamed these passages, no doubt. Strange monsters of the deeps, sightless, or with eyes like phosphorescent torches. But the water was gone now. Blue ooze was caked upon the cave floor. Eroded walls, niches and tiny gullies, crevices, and an arching dome high overhead. A fantastic cave. No one, seeing it as I saw it that morning at dawn, could have believed it was upon this earth. From where de Boer had put me, on the flat top of a small, butte-like dome near the upper end of the sloping cave floor, all the area of this strange bandit camp was visible to me. A little tent of parchment was set upon the dome top. Yours, said de Boer with a grin. Make yourself comfortable. Gutierrez will be your willing servant until we see about this ransom. It will have to be one very large, for you are a damn trouble to me, Grant. And a risk. Food will come shortly. Then you can sleep. I think you will want it. He leaped from the little butte, leaving the taciturn, ever watchful, Gutierrez sitting cross-legged on the ledge near me, with his projector across his knees. The cave was irregularly circular, with perhaps a hundred feet diameter and a ceiling fifty feet high. A drift of the fetid lowland air went through it, into a rift at this upper end, and out through the lower passage entrance which sloped downward thirty feet and debouched upon a rippled ramp of ooze outside. It was daylight out there now. From my perch I could see the sullen heavy walls of a ridge. Mist hung against them, but the early morning sunlight came down in shafts penetrating the mist and striking the oily surface of a spread of water left here in the depths of a cauldron. De Boer's flyer was outside. We had landed by the shore of the sea, and the bandits had pushed the vehicle into an arching recess which seemed as though made to hide it. All this camp was hidden. Arching crags of the ridge wall jutted out over the cave entrance. From above, any passing flyer, even though well below the zero height, would see nothing but this black breathing sea lapping against its eroded fantastic shoreline. Within the cave there was only a vague filtering daylight from the lower entrance, a thin shaft from the rift overhead, and the blue tube light throwing great shadows of the tents and the men against the black rock walls. There seemed perhaps a hundred of the bandits here, a semi-permanent camp by its aspect. Gray parchment tents were set up about the floor, some small, others more elaborate. It seemed as though it were a huddled little group of buildings in the open air instead of in a cave. One tent, just at the foot of my dome, seemed de Boer's personal room. He went into it after leaving me and came out to join the main group of his fellows near the center of the cave where a large electron stove and piped water from a nearby subterranean freshet and a long table set with glassware and silver stood these men for kitchen and eating place. The treasure had not yet been brought in from the flyer, but from what I overheard, it seemed that the radiumized ingots of the ill-fated spawn and perona were to be stored for a year at least here in this cave. I could see the strong room cubby. It was hewn from the rock of the cave wall, its sealed grid, door oval set with metal bars. I saw also what seemed a small but well-equipped machine shop in a recess room at one side of the cave. Men were working in there under the light of tubes, and there was a niche hollowed out in the wall to make a room for de Boer's instruments ether wave receivers and transmitters, the aerial receiving wires of which stretched in banks along the low ceiling. 
There was no activity in there now, except for one man who was operating what I imagined might be an aerial insulator, guarding the place from any prying search vibrations. The main cave was a bustle of activity. The arriving bandits were greeting their fellows and exchanging news. The men who had been left here were jubilant at the success of the chief's latest enterprise. Bottles were unsealed, and they began to prepare the morning meal. My presence caused considerable comment. I was a complication at which most of the men were ill-pleased, especially when the arriving bandits told who I was, and that the patrols of the United States were doubtless even now trying to find me. But de Boer silenced the grumbling with rough words. My business, not yours. But you will take your share of his ransom, won't you? Have done. And Jetta, she had caused comment also. But when the bottles were well distributed, the grumbling turned to ribald banter, which made me shudder that it should fall upon Jetta's ears. De Boer had kept his men away from her, shoving them aside when they crowded to see her. She was in a little tent now, not far from the base of my ledge. My meal presently was brought from where most of the bandits now were roistering at the long table in the center of the cave. Eat, said Gutierrez. I eat with you, Americano. Madre mia, when you are ransomed away from here, it will please me. De Boer is a fool with taking such a chance. With the meal ended, another guard came to take Gutierrez's place, and I was ordered into my tent. The routine of the camp, it seemed, was to use the daylight hours for the time of sleep. There were lookouts and guards at the entrance, and a little arsenal of ready weapons stocked in the passage. The men at the table were still at their meal. It would end, I did not doubt, by most of them falling into heavy alcoholic slumber. I was tired, poisoned by the need of sleep. I lay on fabric cushions piled in one corner of my tent, but sleep would not come. My thoughts ran like a tumbling mountain torrent, and as aimlessly. I hoped that Jetta was sleeping. De Boer was now at the center table with his men. Hans was guarding Jetta. He was a phlegmatic, heavy Dutchman, and seemed decent enough. I wondered what Hanley might be doing to rescue me, but as I thought about it, I could only hope that his patrols would not find us out here. An attack, and most certainly De Boer and his men, in their anger would kill me out of hand, and possibly Jetta also. I had not had a word alone with Jetta since that scene in the control room. When we disembarked, she had stayed close by De Boer. But I knew that Jetta had fathomed my purpose, that she was working to the same end. We must find a way of arranging the ransom, which would give us an opportunity to escape. I pondered it, and at last an idea came to me, vague in all its details as yet. But it seemed feasible, and I thought it would sound plausible to De Boer. I would watch my chance and explain it to him. Then I realized how much aid Jetta would be. She would agree with my plan and help me convince him. And when the crucial time came, though I would be a captive, watched by Gutierrez, bound and gagged, perhaps, Jetta would be at liberty. De Boer and Gutierrez would not be on their guard with her. I drifted off to sleep, working out the details of my plan. Chapter 16. Planning the Ransom I was awakened by the sound of low voices outside my tent, Jetta's voice and De Boer's, and mingled with them the babble of the still hilarious bandits in the center of the cave. But there were only a few left now. Most of them had fallen into heavy slumber. I had been asleep for several hours, I figured. The daylight shadows outside the cave entrance showed that it was at least noon. I lay listening to the voices which had awakened me. De Boer was saying, but why, Jetta, should I bother with your ideas? I know what is best. This ransom is too dangerous to arrange. His voice sounded calmly good-humored. I could hear in it now more than a trace of alcoholic influence. He added, I think we had better kill him and have done. My men think so, too. Already I have caused trouble with them by bringing him. It jolted me into full wakefulness. Jetta's voice, No. I tell you it can be arranged, Hendrick. I have been thinking of it, planning it, Child, well, what? The least I can do is listen. I am no pig-headed American. Say it out. What would you do to ransom him safely? They were just at the foot of my ledge in front of De Boer's tent. Their voices rose so that I could hear them plainly. For all my start at being awakened to hear my death determined upon, I recall that I was almost equally startled by Jetta's voice, her tone, her manner with De Boer. Whatever opportunities 
they had had for talking together, the change in their relationship was remarkable. De Boer was now flushed with drink, but for all that he had obviously still a firm grip upon his wits, and I heard Jetta now urging her ideas upon him with calm confidence, an outward confidence, yet under it there was a vibrant emotion suppressed within her even tone, a hint of tremulous fright, a careful calculation of the effect she might be making upon De Boer. Had he not been intoxicated, with drink and with her, he might have sensed it, but he did not. Hendrick, it can be done, a big price, why not? Because if we are trapped and caught, of what use is the price we might have gotten? Tell me that, wise one. We will not be trapped. And suppose you kill him, won't they track you just the same, Hendrick? No. We would leave his body on some crag where it would be found. The patrols would more quickly tire of chasing a killer when the damage is done. They want Grant alive. Then let them have him alive. For a big price. Hendrick, listen. Well, what? he demanded. What is your plan? Why, well, Hendrick, like this. She stammered, and I realized that she had no plausible plan. She was fumbling, groping, urging upon De Boer that I must be ransomed alive but she had not good reason for it. Well, he prompted impatiently, you, can you raise Great New York on the audiphone, Hendrick? Yes, he said. Hanley's office? Yes, no doubt. Tcha, that would give him a start, wouldn't it? De Boer calmly calling him. He was laughing. I heard what sounded as though he were gulping another drink. By damn, Jetta, you are not the timid bird you look. Call Hanley, eh? Yes, can it be done and still bar his instruments from locating us? Yes, and bar his television. Believe it, Jetta. I have every device for hiding. But call Hanley? Why not? Hendrick, stop. I started. It seemed that he was embracing her, forcing half-drunken caresses upon her. I scrambled through my tent doorway, but Gutierrez, who had come back on guard, at once seized me. Hui! So haste! Back! You! The Spaniard spoke softly, and he was grinning. The chief plays with women's words, no? Charming, senorita, though she dresses like a boy. But that is the more charming, eh? Listen to her, Grant. He gripped me and prodded my side with the point of his knife blade. Lie down, Americano. We will listen. Jetta was insisting. Hendrick, stop. Why? I could see them now. They were seated before the opening of Deborah's tent, a little stove in front of them. Coffee for Jetta, who was seated cross-legged, pouring it, a bowl of drink for De Boer, and some baked bread-stuffed dainties on a platter. Hendrick! She pushed him away as he leaned to embrace her. Although she was laughing with him, I could only guess at the chill of fear that might be in her heart. Foolish, Hendrick! Foolish little bird! Jetta, mine! You, it is you who are foolish, Hendrick! She slid from his embrace and held her brimming coffee cup balanced before her, to ward him off. You think I am really clever, so trust me, Hendrick. Oh, there is a great future for us. You say I inspire you. Let me. Hendrick de Boer, chieftain of the lowlands. My father would have helped you become that. You can build a little empire. Hendrick, why not? Father wanted to make you president of Nareda. Why not build your own lowland empire? We have a hundred men now. Why not gather a thousand? Ten thousand? An empire. Ave Maria, from Gutierrez. This niña thinks big thoughts. De Boer raised his bowl. An empire. De Boer of the lowlands. Go on, you amuse me. We have a nice start with this treasure. Yes, and the ransom money. But you will take me first to Cape Town, Hendrick. We can be married there. I'm seventeen in a month. Of course, Jetta. Haven't I promised? There was no convincingness to me in the way he said it. Of course, to Cape Town for our marriage. Stop, Hendrick, be serious. He had reached for her again. Don't be a fool, Hendrick. Very well, he said. I am all serious. What is your plan? She was more resourceful this time. She retorted, this craven Grant, he fears for his life. But he is very smart, Hendrick. I think he is scheming every moment how he can be safely ransomed. Ha, huh. no doubt of that and he has had experience with Chief Hanley. He knows Hanley's methods, how Hanley will act. Let us see what Grant says of this. She had no plan of her own, but she hoped that by now I had one. 
and she was making an opportunity for me to put it before De Boer. He said, There is sense to that, Jetta. If there's any way to fool Hanley, that craven American has no doubt thought it out. She held another drink before him. Yes, let us see what he says. He drank, and again, as they were near together, he caressed her. What a schemer you are, little bird. You and I are well matched, eh? Gutierrez may be watching us, she warned. They suddenly looked up and saw Gutierrez and me. Ha! Fortunately, it struck De Boer into further good humor. Ha! We have an audience. Bring down the prisoner, Gutierrez. Let us see if his wits can get him out of this plight. Come down, Grant. Gutierrez shoved me down the ladder ahead of him. De Boer stood up and seized me, his great fingers dug into my shoulders. Sit down, American. It seems you are not to die. Perhaps not. The strength of his fingers was hurting me. He hoped I would wince. Mine was now an ignominious roll, indeed, yet I knew it was best. I gasped. Don't do that, you hurt. He chuckled and cast me loose. I added with a show of spirit, You are a bullying giant, just because you're bigger than I am. Hear that, Jetta? The American finds courage with his coming ransom. He shoved me to the ground. Gutierrez grinned and withdrew a trifle. Jetta avoided meeting my gaze. Have some coffee, De Boer offered. Alcohol is not good for you. Now say, have you any suggestions on how I can safely ransom you? It seemed that Jetta was holding her breath with anxiety. But I answered with an appearance of ready eagerness. Yes, I have. I can arrange it with complete safety to you if you give me a chance. You've got your chance. Speak out. You promise you will return me alive, not hurt me? De Duvel, yes. You have my promise. But your plan had better be very good. It is. I told it carefully. The details of it grew with my words. Jetta joined in it. But most of all, it did indeed sound feasible. But it must be done at once, I urged. The weather is right. Tonight it will be dark, overcast, not much wind. Don't you think so? He sent Gutierrez to the cave's instrument room to read the weather forecast instruments. My guess was right. Tonight, then, I said. If we linger, it only gives Hanley more time to plan trickery. Let us try and raise him now, Jetta suggested. The Dutchman, Hans, had joined us. He, too, seemed to think my ideas were good. Except for the guards at the cave entrance, all the other bandits were far gone in drink. With Hans and Gutierrez, we went to the instrument room to call Hanley. As we crossed the cave, with Hans and De Boer walking ahead together, De Boer spoke louder than he realized, and the words came back to me. Not so bad, Hans. We will use him. But I am not a fool. I'll send him back dead not alive. A little knife thrust, just at the end. Safest for us, eh, Hans? End of Jetta of the Lowlands, chapters 15 and 16. Recording by Karen.